This is Play by Playcast. Is that faster than a greyhound? The podcast about play by play guys. For play by play guys, I am told a play by play guy. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Now, here's the host of Play by Play Cast, Todd Bodet. <laughs> Wait, the Motel 6 guy? We'll leave the light on for you. No, Joel Godet. Joe Godet. Joel. Joe. Joel? Joel, with an L. Okay, here's your host, Joel Godet. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. All right, another edition of Play by Play Cast number 107 thanks as always for the subscribe the stream the download my name is joel Gadet, and this of course is the podcast about play-by-play broadcasters for play-by-play broadcasters hosted by a play-by-play broadcaster it's a professional development podcast that dives into the tips tricks experience stories process and preparations of some of the biggest and best play-by-play announcers in the business as always you can find us on social media at PXPCast is the podcast i'm at joel Godet, j-o-e-l-g-o-d-e-t-t or you can shoot me an email J-G-O-D-E-T-T at B-S-U for Ball State University. J-G-O-D-E-T-T at B-S-U dot E-D-U. Big week for me, podcasting. Not only do I have this one, I'm, I'm on another one this week, too. Uh, if, you, if you haven't gotten your fill, like if you still want to hear my voice more, which I don't know why, but if you do, uh, there are a couple other play-by-play podcasts or broadcaster podcasts that are out there. Um, and if you've got time, listen to them all. I mean, they're podcasts. They're on demand. They're always going to be here. You can always go back through and listen to any ones that you want. Um, so, I mean, listen to whatever. I mean, I listen to a ton of podcasts all the time. Um, but Logan Anderson hosts uh, the Say the Damn Score podcast, and he was kind enough to have me on a guest, on a guest, on as a guest uh, this week. So if you go check out Say the Damn Score podcast or SayTheDamnScore.com, you can check out uh, an hour of me pontificating about uh, my career and the different stops that I've made and the apartments I've lived in and the football conditioning tests I've taken and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we dive into uh, all sorts of things about my career. If for whatever reason you're interested in that, uh, you can find that out on uh, the Say the Damn Score podcast this week over at SayTheDamnScore.com or on iTunes. Another big thing coming up for me this week personally, uh, and maybe for you, it all depends, uh, this weekend, or this week, uh, next next week, it's Monday and Monday night, is the seminar and the awards evening for the National Sports Media Association. And uh, the seminar this year, and we've mentioned it a few times on this podcast before, uh, I've got the honor to present at the seminar this year. I'm, I'm doing a presentation with Adam Witten uh, from IMG and from App State on podcasting, on this and what we do here. And uh, so if you're around on Monday and you're in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and you are going to the seminar, 2 o'clock, happy to speak uh, with you guys and powwow about uh, what we're doing here. Uh, but I... I've said before, too, it's kind of like having me present on podcasting is like having a a child present on the toy industry. Uh, I have a podcast. Children have toys. Uh, They don't know how Toys R Us runs, nor do I really know the intricacies of, um, like, the business side and the industry side of podcasting. Uh, But what I enjoyed about setting up this presentation is I really dove into it and learned a lot of the stuff that I didn't know uh, previously about podcasting, and uh, we're going to go over all that stuff uh, on Monday, but it was just wild looking at some of the data and statistics. There are 525 million podcasts on iTunes. That's as of May of this year. 50 billion plus all-time downloads, 18 million episodes 100 different languages, a couple hundred million dollars in advertising uh, a year ago. It's wild what podcasting um, has become. And the thing I thought that was most wild about it was how long people listen and how often they listen. Podcasting is by nature a long-form medium. I mean, you're, you're sitting here listening to a podcast that's probably going to be like an hour. The average person that listens to a podcast, once they click play, listens for 48 minutes. 
Like, you can't get people to watch a viral video for longer than 90 seconds. But if they can play on a podcast, you've got them for almost an hour, which is just wild when you think about it. And the, the big question always is like, well, how long should a podcast be? Well, I mean, A, judge it on that one statistic, but also, uh, you know, there's some, you know, within reason there. Some podcasts are shorter and better for that. Some podcasts are longer. The 2017 podcast of the year was something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Uh, it's a professional wrestling podcast uh, where Bruce Pritchard, who's one of the longtime higher ups in WWE, uh, kind of recounts some kind of behind the stage stories of of the World Wrestling Federation and now World Wrestling Entertainment. Uh, episode 82 of Something to Wrestle, four hours and 16 minutes. Episode 102, 327. Like, I guess the answer to how long should a podcast be? There is no answer. Uh, there is no answer at all. I've, I've, I've found that out in setting up this presentation. The bottom line is, is do a podcast for as long as it's good. Is kind of what the, the way to go is. So keep that in your back pocket if you're ever producing a podcast. And... On top of that, when it comes to uh, how you grow audience for a podcast, one of the things you want to do is like catch iTunes' attention, which I, I, I've talked about a couple times uh, in these segments on the podcast. Uh, I found out there's like apparently five key components to the way the iTunes algorithm works. Consistency of your podcast, iTunes subscribers, downloads, ratings, and reviews. So we have now gotten to the point of this episode where I do the shameless plug. Help this podcast out by growing its audience. Uh, if you get a second and you're listening already on iTunes and you haven't already, um, A, subscribe if you're just streaming this episode. Uh, please do. But also, if you have a rating or a review, just throw a couple stars our way and write a sentence about, hey, I think this podcast is horrible and I just I keep listening to it for 107 episodes, but I don't know why. Um you know, anything will do. Um, but little things that I, I kind of found out about how you can build an audience, how you can grow a podcast, all that stuff uh, was interesting for this presentation. So that whole thing is coming your way if you're at the National Sports Media Association uh, seminar on Monday afternoon. Looking forward to that. Heading down to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Get in a car, drive to Winston-Salem. Will be uh, will be my weekend into the uh, the beginning of next week. Then I go on vacation, and uh, we'll tape a bunch of pods, drop them as I go. But uh, I'll be gone for three weeks, and then, goodness, it's already college football season. Well, then it's CrossFit Games season, and then it's college football season. Summer goes so quickly; it's crazy. Well, as I am currently in my off season, today's guest also currently on his off season, and his name is Mark Boyle. He is the voice on radio of the Indiana Pacers for more than three decades now. And, you know, offseason is a funny word with Mark. Because Mark has done, in the offseason, things like walking 500 miles across the state of Indiana, uh, working at a coffee shop as a barista, uh, broadcasting minor league baseball, broadcasting Cape Cod League baseball for free. Uh, just wanted that experience, and we'll talk about it here on the podcast uh, Mark is, is an interesting guy in that way. He likes to do different things and put himself in some different experiences where he can, you know, meet different people, interact with different people, kind of put yourself in some other people's shoes. Uh, so he's a really interesting guy. And, uh, I guess in, in some ways is kind of the first person that booked himself as a guest on, on this podcast. You know, I mentioned earlier Logan's podcast, and there's also the voice behind the voice by Sean Aronson. And, I've, over the last two years, been pretty particular trying to avoid, as best as I can, doubling up guests that are also on those shows. Now, granted, we all kind of take our own spin on how we do this and, you know, different angles that we, we attack interviews with. Um, but I've always tried to, if they've got somebody on, I will shy away from them. Um, sometimes there have been double ups, um, but I usually try... Um, not to have a guest on that's been on another one of those. So Mark Boyle, when he popped up on the voice behind the voice, I was like, well, damn. Uh, 
uh, especially because we live in the same city. But he actually tweeted at the podcast last week. I think he was listening to the Bill Mercer episode, and he, he tweeted that he was listening and liked it. And I said, hey, you want to be on it? And then we met at Starbucks in Carmel, Indiana, and sat down and, and talked for uh, a little bit more than an hour. So uh, excited to have Mark on because he's an interesting guy with an interesting perspective on this business and this craft and has, you know, he's been with the Pacers for three decades, but before that saw this business through some different interesting lenses. And we'll dive into that. We'll talk about WFAN. He'll talk about, you know, going out to Montana. Uh, And he's also just really good at what he does. Like if you've never heard an Indiana Pacers game, just do yourself a favor because he's really good. Calm, cool, collected, steady. Like, when you turn on 1070 The Fan in Indianapolis and the Pacers are playing, it's just, there's just a flow to it. You always know time and score. You always know where the ball is. And you just feel like Mark is at all times in control. So... You know, one of the things we'd like to do on this podcast is really kind of break down the, the technical side of play-by-play, why guys do what they do and how they do it. And Mark Boyle is a perfect guy with which to have that conversation. So uh, that's why I was really excited to sit down with him in Starbucks to tape this episode. So if you hear some background noise like coffee grinders, uh, that is what that is. We are in a Starbucks. Welcome into our table as uh, as we have this little chat. Let's start with... Why he does this, though, I'm going to go broad scope at the very beginning. Why does he do play-by-play? What got him into it, and what does he enjoy about it? And then we'll hone in on some of the particulars. Mark Boyle, though, of the Indiana Pacers, is our guest this week on PXP Cast. The energy, Joel, is provided by the passion. If you have a passion for something, then the energy comes with it. What I was, I realize now, as I'm older what I was looking for when I was young, and this sounds really egomaniacal, I didn't realize it at the time. I wanted to find something that I had a passion for and then try to be the best in the world at it. So at first I thought I could be a baseball player. I I was a good enough player as a kid uh, that I could entertain such delusions. Uh, But then I got to be in high school and I was still good enough to play, but I realized I wasn't good enough to play at levels much higher than that so I abandoned that and then I thought about being a coach but I realized I didn't have the patience and then I thought about being an attorney I wanted to be a defense attorney which I still think I would have been pretty good at I don't regret not doing it but the reason I didn't do it is is very shallow I just didn't want to go to school that long so then I sort of came into broadcasting not by default, but it wasn't my number one choice. My dad was in broadcasting, and I was always, relative to my peer group, really good at speaking and writing. And it just sort of, plus I like sports, so it appealed to me. Uh, And specifically, I wanted to become a play-by-play guy. I grew up at a time where there was television, I'm not that old, but there wasn't television every day. There was no ESPN. There was no multiple games on every day. It went off the air at night. Yeah, more or less. So we saw, I I grew up in Minneapolis, so we we would see Twins games, but only about 20. And then there was a game of the week on Saturday. That's how you saw other teams. So radio was the thing. And to this day, it's such a vivid memory for me. I, I recall sitting in my room at night, and in Minneapolis, uh, at night, you could reach a lot of stations. You could get Chicago, St. Louis, uh, Detroit sometimes, Milwaukee occasionally. So you could hear all these different guys doing these games. And I became fascinated by men who could make me see something that they could see, even though I wasn't there. And I just thought, boy, that is a really cool thing to do. I wonder if I can do that. So by the time I was about 17 or 18, I decided I wanted to be a play-by-play broadcaster. And it wasn't until I got much older that I realized, see, I thought everybody was doing something they had a passion for and liked going to work every day. And then as I got older and started seeing 
older people once I went into the workforce, not just those in broadcasting, but parents of girls I dated, older people, I saw that not everybody liked going to work. In fact, mo in fact most people didn't like going to work. So I realized now how lucky I was to, to find something I had a passion for and then have, having been lucky enough to have a reasonable level of talent to do it. It's fascinating to me because I'm one of those people that whenever somebody finds out you're a broadcaster, they always go, oh, so like you wanted to do this since you were six. Or friends I have that are broadcasters who grew up listening to Harry Callis and they were five years old and they decided this is what they were going to do for the rest of their life. And I, my answer was, I was like, no, I was a junior in high school when I figured out I was going to do this and that's where I wanted to go. Um, when you look back on it now, is it one of those things where it just kind of makes sense that it fell into the right place for you and you wound up where you were supposed to be? Or, I mean, do you ever have those wonders about what it would have been like to be a defense attorney? Well, I'm not a big believer in destiny, so I don't believe in where you were supposed to be. But I do occasionally wonder about, A, what it would have been like to be a defense attorney, and B, would I have been any good at it? Uh, I think the answer to the latter is yes, but that's because I have a healthy or perhaps an unhealthy ego. I've never regretted not doing it because I've loved this from day one. And I tell this when I speak to kids all the time. I don't want to go back to that first job where I was making $500 a month and working ungodly hours, driving into the middle of nowhere, into crappy locations to do high school games with 20 people in attendance. I don't want to go back to those days, but I say this now and I mean it. I enjoyed that job every bit as much as I've enjoyed this job. And I think that's how you know you have a passion for it. It's not the lifestyle. It's not the economic security, if you're lucky to get to that. It's, it's the work. It's the craft. Um, I think maybe an artist would say the same thing. A, a good artist versus a mediocre artist versus a guy who can think back to the time he was just learning how to paint. I, I, I see a parallel there. And I, and I think if you can find something you have a passion for, you'll always have a job, but you'll never go to work. Let's talk about the craft then a little bit. Um, and back to one of the first things you said in that... Uh, you always wanted to be the best in the world at whatever you were going to do. Uh, how did you attack that, and how did you approach it when you decided this is what you wanted to do when you were 17 or 18? Well, I had a little bit of help. My dad was a broadcaster, so when I was first starting out, he would critique the tapes. But after you get a certain distance down the road, uh, you're beyond sending dad your tapes every day. What's a session with dad like, by the way? Oh, my dad was a hard ass. So, uh, and I didn't appreciate him until I got older either. He was, he was the kind of a guy where if you got a B, why didn't you get an A? If you went one for four, why didn't you go two for four? And it seemed that you could never please him. Now, as I got older, I understand that he was just trying to convey to me that you can always do better. But when you're 15, 14, 12, 16, you don't get that. Uh, I knew my dad loved me and I loved him, but it was very frustrating trying to please him all the time. So he would sit down and listen to these tapes and he, he wasn't harsh. But he wouldn't focus on the good stuff. Maybe because there wasn't any good stuff when I was just starting to do it. I, when I was in high school, he would set me up. Uh, he was the Twins television guy. And at the old Metropolitan Stadium, which is where the Mall of America is now, they had empty booths. So he'd set me up in a booth down the first baseline, very poor angles, but I was in a big league park, and I would do these games into my, you know, at the time, a cassette tape recorder. And then he would listen to him, and, and he would never say, you know, this is pretty good, but this is something you need to pay attention to. He would always point out the stuff I needed to get better at. I figured out the rest of it for myself, and I figured out at a young age, this, this, is, this is how I do games. I was lucky enough to understand early that there's no right way to do it, and no matter how you do it, you're never going to satisfy everybody. So I made a decision when I was starting, I'm going to do it the way I like to hear it. That's been my philosophy, and I was lucky. I grew up in a market where we had mega-talented guys. Uh, as a kid, the voice of the Twins was a, a guy named Herb Carneo, who was there for 40-plus years and is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. The guy with the North Stars, the NHL team, was Al Shaver, who I later worked with, and uh, is in the Hockey Hall of Fame. I grew up listening to guys like this, and so it was easy not to copy them, but to see the way they did games helped me formulate the way I like to listen to games, which in turn helped me decide how I wanted to do the games myself. So he was a big help early, you know, listening to my tapes and stuff. And then as I got older, I used different resources. 
uh, mostly listening to the stuff myself because I knew what I wanted to hear. And earlier in your career, you're hitting it a little bit, but not as consistently as you want to. And then as I got a little bit older, I, w I was still young, I was in my 20s. Now I'm in Minneapolis. And I worked with a guy named Don Vogel. He was a talk show host, really gifted. Uh, he was a uh, guy who lost his sight when he was a boy. So he had the frame of reference. He'd seen things, but he couldn't see things anymore. I would give him my dreams because I thought if I can get a blind guy to see what I'm trying to do here, then I'm on the right path. And he was an invaluable resource. He would point out things that I would never have thought of, but he was giving me his perspective from the point of view of somebody who couldn't see. And so along the way, my dad, a guy like Don, different people I worked with, listening to different guys as I moved around the country in different markets, it all formulated my own approach. And, and those are valuable assets that I think sometimes we don't take advantage of because we don't think they are assets. A, a guy like me who's a professional at this, even now I sit in my car and listen to games and I hear things, oh, I should be doing that. Or that guy does it differently than me. His way is better. Uh, so I, I don't listen to games as a fan. I listen to them as a professional looking, looking for something. Uh, that perfectionism that my dad preached has stayed with me and I'm always trying to get better. So when I listen to these other guys, everybody has something to offer. Even if it's a guy who's so bad, you think, man, there's no way I can do it that way. But everybody has something to offer in terms of teaching. I'm the same way. When my, my friends sit down and watch basketball with me, they get angry because I'm like, stop cheering. I'm trying to listen, <laughs> uh, which always goes great in a crowd. Um, tell me more about bouncing stuff off of someone who is blind and what you learned and even what remains with you that you learned from that that would be different from somebody else. Well, it's been so long ago that I, I can't really cite specifics. This was back when I worked in Minneapolis in the mid-'80s. But I remember on a general level, Don would point out things like, you know what, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what you're talking about here. What are you, what are you trying to say? Uh, I would take for granted, maybe, that something I said would be understood because a sighted person would understand it. Uh, Don lost his sight as a boy, but he didn't start to become interested in hockey until he was a, a, an older person. And so he never had seen a hockey game. He only knew of hockey through what he had heard or what people had told him um, or maybe what he'd read in Braille or whatever. And so terms that I would use that would seem to me to be commonly understood, he would say, what, what, what are you talking about here? And then, oh, okay, maybe the average guy. And I would discard some of it because some of it would be just Don not understanding it because Don couldn't see and had never seen a hockey game. And I would say to myself, that's interesting, but I know that 99.9% .9 of the people listening know what that is. I'm not going to deal with that. But he just put ideas in your head that you had to at least consider, and some of them were quite valuable. Are there some things you could even think about now in terms of things sighted people take for granted? I, I even think back. We had Tim Roy on this podcast I don't know, a couple months ago, and one of the things he talked about was, I think he said, he had used the word baseline and a blind person didn't know what it was uh, in terms of picturing it. And it's something so rudimentary um, that might fall into that 99% of people know what it is. But what are the types of things that, that maybe we take for granted that sitting here you think about maybe it's worth throwing a couple extra words in to describe what this is to give that person that picture? Well, in our game, there are a lot of common phrases that we just have to assume everyone understands because we don't have time to explain. If I say uh, they're running a pick and roll, I need to assume that you know what that is. I, I don't have the time to tell you that a pick and roll is one guy coming up here and standing in the way of the other guy. No, I, it's radio. It's too fast. So we take certain things for granted, but I will occasionally explain things that I use as my own terms. Um, and things that have come into play in, in, in recent years. For example, um, the restricted area under the basket. Now, that's not brand new, but it's new enough that there might be somebody who doesn't, and, and, and the restricted area is not common to all levels of, of play. So if I say, I might sometimes just say, uh, so-and-so had position, but he was in the restricted area. Or I might say so-and-so had position and he was in the restricted area, so it doesn't matter if he has position because when you're in the restricted area, but rarely, but once in a while. As, as the rules change, as the terminology changes, um, 
we have terminology in our game that I didn't know what it meant until I asked. I, I started hearing people a few years ago talking about a skip pass. I didn't know what that was, so I asked. A pocket pass. I didn't know what that was either. And I'm around the game every day, so I'm assuming that if I don't know what it is, then the fan listening doesn't know what it is either, and so I need to explain it if I use it. Take me back to the beginning, too, when you were um, listening, growing up as a, a kid, and, and all of the voices you had in Minneapolis, uh, and you decided, I'm going to do this the way that, that I like to hear it. Um, what did you like to hear? What did you like about the voices that you had, um, the Carneals and the Shavers, and what stood with you that said, this is something that I'm going to help mold into myself? Well, in general, it was just that these guys could make me see something that I couldn't literally see because I wasn't there. But specifically, from Herb Carneal, I picked up, he was, he was a good broadcaster, obviously, his credentials speak for themselves. But specifically what I picked up from him, he was so conversational. He, he, he felt, it felt like he was talking to me, like it was just he and I sitting at the ballpark. And that, that's a very, very unusual skill. Not everyone can master it. And so... In my mind, I want. This is why I don't use scripts. When I when I do my game open, I, I have bullet points because I don't want to sound like I'm reading off a script. I want to sound like you and I are talking. That's something I picked up from Herb, outside of his obvious brilliance. From Al, it was an enthusiasm for the game. It was uh, the descriptive way that he would describe things. Uh, he would describe things like uh, this is way back in the '80s, so they probably have a more a sophisticated way of doing it now, but in our broadcasts with the North Stars, we used to um, hang a microphone over the net behind the goal to pick up sounds around the goal. Um, so occasionally, if you could hear a, a player yapping, and I would think, boy, I'm sitting in the booth with Al. How do I hear that guy down there? I, I'm a kid. I don't know. And every once in a while, Al would say, ah, our microphone over the goal picks up so-and-so. Yeah, so little things like that. Um, and this is where repetition comes into play because when you're starting, it's the same as anything else. When you start to learn how to hit a baseball or read a book or anything, when you first start doing it, you're thinking about doing it. Once you get to X number of repetitions, now you're just doing it. And in our world, you have to filter. You, you can't possibly describe every single thing. There just isn't enough time. So in your head, you have to be filtering out what's important and what isn't. And when you're first starting, you don't know what that is. And so you end up speaking too rapidly and trying to jam too many comments into a, a window that they just don't fit. That's where the repetitions come in because I'm at the point in my career now where it just naturally filters through. I know what to say and what not to say. I know what I can omit and what I and what I need. For example, in, a, in an NBA game with a 24-second shot clock, this is common to all levels of broadcasting. The two most important elements are time and score. You can never give them enough. So if I have to miss a pass 40 feet from the basket to mention the time and the score, then I'm doing that. I don't need to describe that pass because it's not as important as time and score. But it's not a conscious thing. I'm not going, okay, time and score now, time and score now. I just know to do it because I've done thousands of games. If you've never heard Mark broadcast, too, by the way, this is what he sounds like when he does a basketball game. It's, it's a very, you talked about the conversational See, aspect well, of it. That's what I picked up from her. And to me, it's so important because it's a communication medium, and you want, you want to connect with your fans, if for no other reason than it's selfish. If you connect with your fans, you can possibly stay employed a bit longer. So there is that selfish element to it, but there's also... If you don't connect with your fans, then you're just pissing into the wind, aren't you? I, I think. And so that conversational element, that's what resonated with me with Herb. And I, I'm glad to hear you say that because it's something that I try to do. How long did it take you uh, to figure out and, and what did you kind of whittle out of what you talk about in terms of description when you mention, like, from a pacing standpoint, a conversational standpoint, in order to have that, you can't be rapid fire everything. Um, so when, what did you decide is important to you in terms of uh, description and in terms of being able to keep that tone and keep that pace um, and having to kind of pick and choose where you fight your battles? It's a, it's a good question, and I don't even know if I can quantify it because I don't know that it was a conscious decision. But in my head, I have a, a mental list of things that are important in de-escalating value. Time and score, number one. There's nothing more frustrating than getting into your car, turning on a game, 
and not being able to know what's going on. And early in your career, at least for me, when you are not as secure, when your ego is more fragile, I couldn't accept that people weren't listening to my entire broadcast and hanging on my every word. Well, as you get older, if you're smart, you understand that, particularly now where television is so prevalent, people are not listening to your entire game. They're listening to you at work or as they get in and out of their cars or whatever. And the number one thing we all want when we turn on that game is who's winning and where are they in the game. So that's my number one thing. After that, uh, the important things are who has the ball, what are they doing with it, uh, who's guarding the guy with the ball. These are things that I've never sat down and like made a list of, but they're in my head. And, and so I think they help me prioritize what I need to say and what I don't. If, if Team A has the ball and the coach of Team A is standing up and screaming, maybe it's important, maybe it isn't. It depends who coach, the coach of Team A is. Is that his normal demeanor? Is he pissed off about something specific? If not, then we ignore it. But we don't consciously do that. It just, it, we see it and then we discard it or we use it based on experience and repetitions. What's different for you if you're uh, on the road, a lot of times you're by yourself, uh, or if you've got Slick with you, or if you have somebody other than Slick with you, um, in terms of how much leeway you have, um, how much space you have to give them, um, how that changes anything that you might do? It does change it, and it's much easier, at least for me, to do a game solo. However, it's not nearly as much fun. And as a listener, I always like to hear two voices. No matter how good a guy is, I like to hear an exchange of ideas. I like to hear somebody else's viewpoint as a listener. So I always like to have a guy there, and I've been so lucky to have Slick all these years. But even within the framework of having somebody versus not, there are different dynamics because it depends who that somebody is. Um, I've worked with a lot of guys over the years. Recently, in addition to Slick, who doesn't travel with us anymore, uh, we've had Austin Crozier and Scott Pollard and Eddie Gill and a few others. And each one of those guys is different. I start with a new guy. I always tell the new guys this because I want them to be comfortable. And oftentimes, they'll stick an ex-player in there who's never done it. So you have to take into account that he doesn't know how to do it. He might be nervous. He might be unsure of himself. So I always tell these guys, I, I got two things here. If you have something to say, say it. And don't talk when I'm talking. Those are my rules. And then after we've done a few games, I get a feel for what they want to do, how comfortable they are. And then you try to use their own specific skills as best you can. It's sort of like... Uh, it's sort of like being a point guard on a basketball team. You know what your teammates can do, and you deliver the ball accordingly. It's the same way here, although we only have one team. But I want to maximize what they have to offer, and it takes a little bit of time to do that. And the only guy I ever made exception for was Slick, because he doesn't follow the when I'm talking, you don't rule. <laughs> but he's Slick, so we live with it. <laughs> um, why, uh, why is it easier by yourself? Um, I can imagine why it's more fun with Slick, but why is it easier by yourself? Because I don't have to worry about getting the other guy involved. Okay. Uh, and on radio, you don't have to worry anyway. The TV is the analyst's game, and, and he's the key guy on the broadcast. Radio, it's different. I, I think about this. If you watched a game on television and there was no analyst, wouldn't it be weird and it would be hard to watch and listen to maybe? On radio, that's not the case because play-by-play -play is the primary element. On television, there's a bunch of crowd shots, uh, there's time to talk because you don't have to describe every piece of the action. It's an entirely different broadcast, and the analyst is paramount. On radio, a good analyst adds a lot, but you can have a good broadcast without one. So, specific to the guys I talked about and why it's easier to work alone is because it's just me then. And I have opinions, and I have information, and I can easily share it. There's plenty of time. When I work with these other guys, a lot of the stuff that I would share normally I don't get to because I want to give them latitude to do their thing. So the entire approach is different. I don't, I don't prepare differently, but I present differently. Uh, in a solo broadcast, I'm going to talk about anything I want whenever I want. If I've got a partner, that becomes secondary to how I can get him involved. Um, 
I, I'm always curious to talk to people that do basketball solo from the basketball side of things as well, uh, just because I've been in situations where I've done games solo for the last couple of years, um, and my basketball career ended when I was in fifth grade. Uh, I, I was not good. Uh, there was a reason it ended when I was in fifth grade, and my dad was my coach. Uh, and since then... I, Boy, if your career ended in fifth grade and your dad was your coach, you yeah. must have really been awful. Yeah, my mom was not happy. Uh, but, it, you know, as I've gotten older, I've, I've, I've learned, obviously, more about the game. And I and even got to the point last year in the off season where I said to one of our assistants, I was like, hey, Grunk, I want to sit with you if you have time. And we sat and broke down film for two hours because I wanted to have a better understanding of how our system worked so I could talk about it that way. Um, but for me as a broadcaster, I love having the analyst there because I can lean on him for the basketball specific things and catch things that are happening off ball movement that's happening that I'm not paying attention to and kind of understanding the the why of of my what that I'm seeing um, how do you account for the why uh, in addition to what you're saying when you're just solo well when you're solo sometimes you don't know the why because we don't have the luxury if I see something off the ball it's because I saw it out of the corner of my eye I'm not. I'm always focused on where the ball is and who has it because that's the primary thing you need to be concerned about. So I don't see a lot of that stuff. Whereas an analyst has the luxury of he can watch whatever he wants. Maybe the last few possessions have been such that there's a trend and he sees it. Oh, I, I see this guy. He's going back door. I'm going to see. I'm going to watch and see how does he get through that back door. What what's wrong with the defender? I, I can't do that because then I lose the ball. So he he can, A, he knows more than I do, hopefully, and B, he can look at things I can't. So And plus, even if he doesn't know more than I do, he has more credibility in that area than I do. If Mark Boyle says uh, the defender down on the block is not getting the job done, it's not the same as Scott Pollard saying, because Scott Pollard was down on the block and Mark Boyle was not. I might know enough to comment with some degree of knowledge, but I don't know enough to comment with any degree of experience. And so that's what that guy adds. The guy who has played or coached has been in a position that I haven't, and just for that reason, he can add stuff that I can't. And that comes back to not preparation changing, but presentation changing, yeah. I would imagine. And, and if you're so, if you're solo and you can tell, right? going back a few years, but Roy Hibbert's having trouble on the block. Um, and you didn't want to say it that way because you're Mark Boyle and not Scott Pollard or Austin Crozier. Um, what do you say instead, or how do you present that instead? I try to stay away from, from the technical aspect of it because, hey, I'm, I'm not, let's face it, I've, I've been around here for a long time and I've done a lot of games. That doesn't mean I'm qualified to analyze post-play. It just doesn't. But I can make general observations. Let's use that same example. Let's say that, well, let's use a real-life example. Not that Roy's not real life, but let's use a Miles Turner example. One of Miles' things this year was on a switch, he'd get down on the block there with a shorter guy on him, and he'd just pass the ball back out. Now, watching that, I try not to watch the game as a fan because I don't feel you have that luxury. But as somebody who hopes the Pacers do well, and what is watching a 6'11 guy not take advantage of a 6'4 guy, it's sort of annoying. <laughs> and so you're tempted to say, what, what is he doing? But instead you say, uh, the, on three of the last four possessions, they've gotten Turner down in the post against a shorter defender, and he's passed the ball back outside. Then you, the listener, can draw your own conclusion. Uh, I'm saying the same thing, but in a more tactful way. Whereas I'm perfectly fine with the former player, particularly if it's a big guy like Pollard, saying, you know what, he's got to attack that guy down there. I could say that, but A, it doesn't carry the same weight, and B, who am I to tell Miles Turner how to play basketball? <laughs> so that's how I look at it. There's a, there's a, there are multiple ways to say the same thing and convey the same message without getting too analytical. You said earlier, too, you're around all the time, so you develop some relationships where sometimes I would imagine if you had to say something critical, you could get away with it uh, a little bit because they know you. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do when you're around all the time and how you prepare and how you, what you look for, uh, where you go, um, just kind of how you try to absorb through osmosis uh, everything you can about a team. 
Well, I don't try to absorb everything I can. For example, I don't feel it's that important for me to understand the X's and O's. So I go to a practice and I watch, and afterwards I might ask a coach about X or a player about Y, but typically it's not about strategy and tactics. It's about um, why, if it's a coach, why is this guy playing instead of this guy? Or if it's a player, you seem to be struggling lately. Is there anything going on? And here's the reason I go to practice. It's a good idea anyway, but I'm not going there to gain knowledge and expertise so much as I'm going there so they know who I am and they know that when I am critical, because my credibility is the most important thing I have, and I and the Pacers have been great about this where some teams aren't, they don't want me blasting their players, and I don't want to blast their players, but they're okay with criticism as long as it's fair and not personal. So I want these guys to understand that, hey, I'm not one of you, but we work for the same people, and I like you, and I hope you do well, but part of my job is to comment on what you're doing. If they know who you are, then they know that you're not a threatening person. They know that if they have a beef, they can come and say something to you. Because what typically happens is, and it doesn't happen very often, but when there is a problem, it'll be player A's friend who heard it from player A's. It's like that game telephone when you played when you were a kid. I might say, Miles Turner has struggled. He's shooting 35% from the floor over the last five games. By the time it gets back to Miles Turner... And Mark, is, why do you want them to trade Miles Turner? <laughs> yeah, this is not a real-life example. It didn't happen. But by the time it gets back to Miles, it's Mark thinks you suck and should be out of the league. <laughs> because by the time the message is translated, first of all, the person hearing it is a, is a friend or a spouse or a family member who has predisposed to think that if you're not saying something positive, you're saying something negative. So they come at it from a different standpoint altogether, and by the time it gets back to the player, it can be anything from what to are you serious? And so I want them to know who I am, why I'm there, so that if there ever is any kind of a conflict, we can resolve it like adults. How else do you prepare? Um, what else do you do? What, what do you read? Um, what do you look at? And how do you organize it so that you know where it is quickly? It's a process, and I, I tinker with it all the time. I, I have my stuff that I have right in front of me during the broadcast, and it's been essentially the same for the last several years. But as I was younger, I, I tinkered with it. And how, to, how can I best do it? How can I make the information accessible and easy to see? Now I have a system that I use. And the way I do the research is this. It's, it's, it's multi-tiered. I do a lot of reading, uh, newspapers, which are, I mean, when I started, there was no internet, so forget about seeing the other city's newspapers. No, no chance of that. Um, but that's accessible now, and there's a few websites that I consider go-tos that I check on a daily basis, the other team's game notes. Uh, anything I can find out about the teams, the league, the players, the coaches, I'm looking for. I don't, I don't use all of it. I don't even put all of it down. I, I sift through it based on what I think is important. And then the other part of the preparation is personal. You go to practice. You talk to players and coaches. You go to the game early. You talk to the other broadcasters, the other writers. If you know people with the other team, you talk to them. And one of the advantages of doing that over a period of years and years is that, A, you always know somebody with the other team. And, B, they know you by now. Even officials will talk to me because they know that what they tell me, I know how to use. Either I can't use it at all, or I can use it judiciously, or I can use it completely. But they know me, and they know to trust me to know how to use it. That's part of the process when you start a new job or work with a new team or a new league or a different sport. And players and coaches now are more suspicious and untrusting than they've ever been because it's so easy for them to get burned now compared to how it used to be. So they're more cautious. If I were coming in now, I think it would be harder to build a rapport than it was when I did come in. And, and based on that, maybe this next question isn't uh, as easy of one to talk about because it is different that way. But um, And maybe it's more of a psychology question than anything else. But how do you develop some of that? Because obviously if you're talking to certain people, uh, they know why you're talking to them and you know why you're there and you know everybody understands that. But to 
create that relationship where uh, it's more than you f- more than you feel like you're just using them and they feel like they're being used for information and there is some sort of mutual admiration society there good question and that's why when we get a new guy whether it's a rookie or a free agent or a guy who comes in the middle of a season in a trade after I introduce myself I don't generally bother them for a while I want them to see me around to get a feel for okay this this is the radio guy uh, I will guarantee you that even though they don't all know my name, they all know I'm the radio guy. They might not know my name. Players don't really give a damn about us, and I don't mean that in a negative way. If I were a player, I wouldn't either. So, okay, this is the radio guy. He seems harmless, and maybe if I'm lucky, they'll see me talking to some of the veteran guys, and if only subconsciously, well, if... if we don't, we don't really have very many veteran guys who have been around for a long time now, but back in the day. Well, if Reggie will talk to this guy, maybe it's okay for me to talk to him. Um, players are observers, and they see things, and perception is reality. So I want them to trust me. And trust trust. And let's face it, there are guys who we've had on our team that I've only exchanged pleasantries with. I don't need to talk very often, and I don't mean to denigrate this guy, but I'll use an example. There's really not many occasions where I need to talk to Joseph Young. He doesn't play very much, but I'll still touch base and say hi to him and, and let him know. Uh, you don't, you, what you don't want to do, and this is why you go around, you want to you know, greet players. Hey, how you doing? If that's the only conversation you have in a week, it's better than you don't talk to him at all until you need to talk to him in three months. Just just like any human interaction. It's no... I think people sometimes think dealing with celebrities or famous people is different than dealing with regular people. And there are nuances to it where it is different. But they're still regular people, and they still don't trust you until you earn it, just like anyone in this place would be. So I try to, and I'm not a people guy, but I try to be respectful. I, I try to at least acknowledge guys when I see them, and I try not to bother them unless I need to. Tell me about, um, and this is a broad swath question, um, but I, I pulled a quote when I was looking into your background a little bit, and it was from um, from David Benner with the Pacers, who said the Pacers took a chance on him when he was young and unproven. Um, and obviously uh, have proved them right in that capacity. But uh, when you first started with the Pacers, what's now been three decades, um, what was it like for you to come into the NBA um, as a young guy um, and cut your teeth that way and uh, not learn on the fly so much, but uh, in some respects learn on the fly a little bit and, and... prove you belong, if that makes sense, uh, and, and, and and earn it every night. It does make sense. I was not a total novice when I got here. I started when I was so young that I'd been in broadcasting for several years. Yeah, you were like four cities in at that point. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I was still in my 20s, so, uh, but I hadn't been in the NBA. I'd been, I'd been in the NHL for a little while. I'd done Division I ball, so I'd been around, for lack of a better term, high-profile environments. But I hadn't been the lead guy. I was at Division One, but in the NHL, I was Al's backup and, and, the, and the pregame between periods guy. So it wasn't my job. I was waiting for Al to not die. He's still alive. He's in his 90s. But I was hoping that maybe he would retire. Well, he never did, so I moved on. But I, this was my first, for lack of a better term, major league job. It was my job. And I, I was confident, so I was never nervous or anything like that. But still, I was unproven. And I understood that I had to prove myself. So what I tried to do when I first got there was stick to the basics. I called the game. Um, first of all, I didn't have the requisite knowledge to have any opinions. And so I didn't want to come off as somebody who was trying too hard to show you how much he knew. I understood that my job was to call the game. And I knew that as long as I did that, and then hopefully as time went on, gained credibility with fans, coaches, players, then I could branch out a little bit and offer more opinions. I I don't know this for a fact because I haven't saved any of it, but I'm pretty sure that if you went back and listened to my first year or two, you would hear me offering far fewer opinions than I offer now. 
I feel knowledgeable now. I feel confident in saying something about a player or something about an official because I've seen them play dozens of times. I've seen these officials dozens of times. I, I know about them. doesn't mean my opinions are correct or sometimes perhaps even well-informed, but I do feel that it's acceptable for me to deliver them now where when I first came I didn't. So I, I, I tried to approach it at the beginning as, yes, I need to earn credibility. And by doing that, I'll stick with what I know, which was I knew how to call games. I'll stick with that. And then as time goes and I feel a little more knowledgeable and confident, then I'll start to put in the other elements. And that's how I looked at it. Uh, what's the earliest broadcast you've gone back and listened to? Uh, well, I, I listened to them all when I was doing them. So, And I don't remember the specifics, but I do know that my first broadcast was an American Legion baseball game in Miles City, Montana. I can't remember who was playing or anything about the game, but I know that was my first broadcast. And I listened to every one of those tapes because I was still getting repetitions. I still didn't really know what I was doing, and they were valuable. Now I don't listen to all my tapes anymore, and I don't... I'm still paranoid enough that I always save tapes in case I need them, you know, in case they decide, you know, the ship's sailing without you, son, and I need another... I still save tapes. Uh, but I don't have anything older than three or four years. Um, and I can't, I, I'm not a hoarder, I'm, I'm, I'm the anti-hoarder. I have hardly any memorabilia from my career. I have no tapes except the ones I need to get jobs. I, I kind of wish I had tapes now because I remember thinking when I was starting how good I was. And you have to have that attitude to succeed, but I, I'm pretty sure that I went, if I could find those tapes, He'll go back and listen to them, I'd be just horrified. <laughs> so uh, I can't answer that question because I don't really remember listening to any older tapes, at least not in recent years. Random aside, and I'll come back to this line of questioning, um, but what's the oldest piece of memorabilia or the coolest piece of memorabilia that you have if you don't keep a ton of it? Um, well, I'm a bit of a narcissist. I, I don't really have any Pacers memorabilia. I only have MJB memorabilia. <laughs> So I have the ball. They gave me the ball for my 1,000th game. That was in uh, Boston. I have the ball for my 2,000th game. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, this, this would be Pacer memorabilia, and, and I only have it. It's a picture of the Pacers on the Thames River in London. Team picture when, from when we went there. Uh, they had a bunch of them, they had it taken, and then they had a bunch of them framed to give to the players. And one of the players who was supposed to get one was either traded or cut or something, and so they gave it to me. And I liked it, so I have it on my wall. Uh, but otherwise, the stuff that I do have, which isn't much, is, is stuff that's related to my career. I have a poster of, of the uh, 30 for 30 that ESPN did on Reggie and the Pacers that Reggie autographed. I was in that documentary, and so it's not about Reggie, it's about me. Most of my stuff is about me. I, I, I'm not big on, I don't have any framed jerseys or anything like that, and I'm not denigrating guys that do. Uh, people save different things. If you talk to Chris Denary, our TV guy, he told me once, and I don't doubt it, that he has every one of his scorecards in a closet. When I'm done, I throw mine away. I just started going through all of mine because I have them in a closet, too, okay, and it takes then. up way too much space. Yeah, well, so guys save different things. But the stuff that I have saved is stuff about my career, and I don't even save that much of it. I save, I save the stuff that's meaningful to me because I'm proud of it, but I don't want to be the guy that when you walk into his house, it's a, a shrine to Mark Boyle. That's a, that's a, even by narcissist standards, that's a little much for me. I didn't know if you were going to say, like, the cup that they threw at Ron Artest. <laughs> Actually, I would have saved that if I had it, but I don't have it. <laughs> um, okay. I don't know how to swing back to where we were, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do it. Um, now I don't remember where we were. Um, this is great. I'll have to edit this. <laughs> no, 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 no. See, you don't have to edit. It's a conversation. Sometimes conversations have lulls. So uh, just move on to the next thing. Or I, I don't remember what the last thing we were talking about was. Yeah, neither do I. On that note, uh, <laughs> I know that at the beginning uh, you talked about baseball and your love of baseball. Um, and I know that uh, it's something you have broadcast professionally. But do you ever look back or even look forward um, to wanting to do more baseball or maybe wish that not to denigrate where you are, but like yeah, I, if I could do it all over again, maybe Major League Baseball would be something that would be really cool. 
Uh, wish is too strong. I, I got into it to do baseball. Baseball to me is A, the hardest sport to do, B, the sport best suited for radio, and three, the sport that takes the most versatility. You, the action is, a, unlike hockey or, or basketball, the action is, is minimal. It's, it's a small percentage of the broadcast. There's a pitch, and then there's a, you know, depending on who the pitcher and hitter are, there's a five-minute delay, and then there's another pitch. And I love baseball, but it presents challenges that basketball and hockey don't. So I did, I did a season of rookie league ball in 05. Three years ago, I went out to Cape Cod and did a season in the Cape League, which is a summer league for college players. And I'll probably try to find something to do again. Uh, to say that I wish... I had done Major League Baseball would be a bit much because it's not true. Plus, it would be insulting. I mean, I'm in the NBA. I mean, that would be like saying, hey, thanks for the gold watch, but where are the platinum diamonds? <laughs> so, no, I don't wish that I'd done it. I wanted to do it, and if the opportunity presented itself, I would jump at it. Uh, maybe not on a full-time basis because I don't want to give this up, but if, if, uh, if a team called and said, hey, uh, we heard you could do some baseball, one of our guys is sick, can you, can you sit in for a series? I would definitely do that, and I've done it at the AAA level. Did some games from Buffalo a, a while back, several years ago. I've sat in with Howard Kelman at the Indians a few times, and I, I love it. The ballpark is just so cool to me. But to say I wish I'd done it or I regret not doing it, that, that wouldn't be true because I've been really fortunate with the opportunities I've had. And the NBA is tremendous. I love it. But, yeah, of course, I, I would want to do baseball again if I had the opportunity. Tell me about the Cape thing, um, because it always intrigued me when I found out you were going to YD, because I don't want to say a first professional because I didn't get paid, um, but it was my first professional, air quotes, broadcasting experience after my sophomore year of college when I went to Orleans um, back in 2007. And, you know, you would go to a game and just like anything, like, oh, let's go talk to the other broadcaster. It's Johnny who goes to Northwestern. Um, like, I can't imagine what it would have been like to walk into Yarmouth and be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go talk to the other team's broadcaster, Mark Boyle of the Pacers. <laughs> um, what was it like for you to be in an environment with uh, a lot of broadcasters that were in college and, and kind of coming up um, and having those kinds of guys around you? And I don't know if there was kind of a cool mentorship side of that. And then also just being in uh, that type of baseball setting where you had a lot of college-age kids, obviously in the NBA, you you get a lot of college-age kids, too. Um, but it's different in that setting. What was cool about that summer for you um, from a personal standpoint, from a professional standpoint? Uh, it was cool on so many levels. Number one, I got to do baseball. I had done the rookie league in 05, and I wanted to do some more baseball. And I wanted to go to a part of the country I'd never been to. And I knew of the Cape League. Now, for those that don't know, the Cape League is a summer league for elite college players. It's, you know, you're recruited. Uh, many of these guys have already been drafted. It's, it's the best college summer league in the country. And the appeal geographically was that it was, uh, it was Cape Cod. And we had no road trips, only road games. There was nobody further than 45 minutes away from where I was. So you'd drive to the game, and then you'd be done, and you could go home and sleep in the same bed. So what I did was I sent applications to all the teams. I sent him an email and said, this is who I am, this is what I want to do. And YD was the first one that got back to me. And they said, you can come, but, you know, we don't pay. You know, it's a volunteer, right? I said, I'm cool with that. Can you find me a place to live? So they found a lady who lived by herself who had a loft that she rented to me for $80 a week. So I was King Kong. I wasn't making any money, but I wasn't really out of pocket too much either. So that's the background. Well, then I got there, and I think there were uh, 10 teams in that league. And the broadcasts were all on the internet, and each team had two or three broadcasters, and I was the only professional. The others were all college kids. So it, wasn't, it was not a, develop, a developmental league just for players. It was for kids that wanted to be journalists, uh, reporters, broadcasters. It was a really cool opportunity for all of these kids in all of these different areas. And the thing that amazed me, and this is going to... I had a great time. This is not a criticism, but it amazed me anyway. Because I remember when I was that age, I would have approached it entirely differently. It, it just, and this, this isn't about me being an NBA guy. That said, I was amazed at, at how few of those broadcasters actually took the opportunity to pick my brain. 
I would never have missed such a chance when I was that age, and I know you wouldn't have either, but a lot of them did. Not a criticism. I just was surprised. I, I guess that sounds a little bit like, um, you know, get off my lawn. But I, mean, I don't know if it's an intimidation factor. I don't know. Maybe, but I made it clear to my general manager and the president of the league, make sure all these kids know. Because I, I have a reputation in our league for always being available to younger broadcasters. I feel it's part of our responsibility. And not only that, I like it. Um, and, so, and I'm not saying none of them did. Some of them did. And, and some of them are still in touch with me. And I try to offer whatever advice and counsel I can. But the reason it was, it was a great summer for me is, and, I, and here's the other thing, I was the number two guy on the broadcast. The kid I was working with was a, a young man named Anthony Santanello who was going to Hofstra. He's out now and he's, he's in the business. But uh, he was our lead guy, and I was the number two guy. So I think I did... Uh, Maybe I, I think I did the third, fourth, and seventh, and he did the other innings. Um, but it was fun to, to get my baseball fix. The, it was a beautiful, scenic part of the country. It was fun working with the kids. It was fun being around baseball. Uh, and, and it was good baseball. It was really good baseball. Uh, you know, a lot of these kids ended up being first-round draft picks. Um, I don't think any of them from my year, which was only three years ago, are in the big leagues yet, but they will be. A lot of them are in professional baseball now. And so it was a combination of getting to do baseball, watching kids play at a high level, working with kids in my field who wanted to get where I am, and having an opportunity to mentor and counsel. It was, it was, it was a win-win-win-win-win-win-win for me. Did you learn anything about broadcasting, about yourself, that maybe you didn't expect to just by being there and doing that? No, but I did learn this. I, I learned something about young people. I, I have I have friends, not from the Cape, but just in my, I have friends who are in their 20s, 30s, 50s, 70s. And the older you get, if you're not careful, one of the reasons, I don't do this consciously, but one of the reasons I have young friends is because I feel that hanging around with people of different generations helps you from getting too myopic, uh, from looking at things only through one set of lenses. And I had been to the point, I'd gotten to the point in my life where I, I talk to high school and college kids all the time. I generally spend most of July and August visiting schools. And the thing, I had become a little disillusioned because you talk to these kids and a lot of them don't want to pay dues. They don't want to go to Decimal Point, Montana, which I did, or, uh, you know, Hole in the Wall, Idaho. And if you don't have to go there, good for you. But not wanting to go there tells me you don't have a passion for this. And I had become a little bit disillusioned about kids. I do think on a general level, young people today are more self-entitled than we were, more coddled than we were. But I'm sure my parents thought the same about my generation. And I, I think in general, every generation is more coddled than the previous generation. So that said, I had become a little bit disillusioned with young people in our field and how hard they were willing to work and what they were willing to do to chase their passion. But that summer on the Cape disabused me of that notion. I saw how hard those kids worked, and I saw how much they wanted to be broadcasters. They gave up their summers. You know, they, the, Cape, the Cape isn't like professional baseball. We generally had a day or two off every week. But it's still not like uh, you've got you to be there, and you've got to be there pretty much every day. And these kids were willing to give up their summer to do that. And most of them, as far as I could tell, were serious about it and committed to it. And it, it, it gave me a refreshing viewpoint of young people going into broadcasting, which I needed at that point. And you've got to have a job because you've got to pay the rent. Like, yeah. you know, I worked summer camps in the mornings, and then I showed up and broadcast a game. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I remember what I wanted to ask you earlier. Uh, so rewind if we may um but we were talking about uh when i asked you about the the earliest thing you had listened back to um and you said you, you have now going back about three years everything uh how often do you currently go back and listen to stuff and what do you glean from that when you do it i listen on two levels i try to listen to something at least once a week uh, whether it's a quarter or a, a segment or a half and then I try to go back on a, on a secondary level and wait two to three months 
and then pick out a game that I don't really remember anything about and go back and listen to it. And I'm listening for something specific there. When I listen once a week, I want to make sure... What I'm listening for when I listen to the tapes on a regular basis is... I want to make sure I'm not falling into any traps, using the same phrasing too often, uh, getting lazy is what I call it. The other one is I want to listen to a game that I don't remember anything about, except on a real generic level, and then listen to a segment and see, can I still see that game? Because if I can't, and it's happened, then I'm thinking, okay, pay attention, because that, that wasn't good enough. I I get the basics. You're still doing the basics, but I, I'm not seeing that ball go into the post. You're, you're getting lazy. Because my whole thing is to get you to see something that you can't see because you're not there. I want you to see what I see. And every once in a while, I'll listen to one of those two- or three-month-old tapes, and I it's not up to speed. It's good enough, I guess, but it's not what I'm after. I need you to see what I'm seeing. And sometimes, and this is not an excuse, but you're doing four games a week. It's 80, 82 games a year. The, the travel is, it's charters and first-class hotels. So I'm not saying it's KOA campgrounds and broken-down buses. That said, there's an element of stress and fatigue to it if you're not careful. And that's no excuse for not doing it the way you want to do it. So when I hear a tape like that and I say, okay, not bad, but not good enough. It refocuses me. That's why I go back and try to listen to a tape that's two or three months old. Will you reset in some respects? If I hear something that I don't like, how much will you go back into the next game and hone in on something and focus in on something? And can there be a danger there of then almost hurting yourself because you try, you know, they always say, you know, don't grind the bat into sawdust, don't try too hard, uh, and striking that balance. I get that. And no, it's not, it's not, uh, let's just say that I listened to a game from last week and I heard myself describing an entry pass into the post the same way too often. I'm not going to go into the next game bound and determined not to do that, but it's, it's in my mind. It's, it's bouncing around in there with other stuff. It's, it's part of that night's, not focus, but it's, it's bouncing around in there. And usually that's good enough because it's part of a bigger issue. If I'm describing the same thing in, in too pedestrian a manner or too common a manner, that's one of my things I'm trying to avoid anyway. Uh, but that just reinforces that I need to do that. And it's not when the ball goes to the wing, I'm like, okay, it's going to go into the post now. i got to make... No, not that. But it's, it's, it's all part of... It's hard to describe. It's like, it's like doing anything else. If you're playing baseball and you've played it enough so that let's say you're a college or a professional baseball player, you know how to hit. You're not getting into the batter's box and thinking, okay, this guy, it, 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 you're not thinking about anything necessarily. It's just an accumulation of knowledge that you, I, I, are you familiar with the, with the Gladwell? Uh, you need, uh, was it 10,000 repetitions to become an expert at something? It's, it's part of that process. So once you get far enough down the road with those repetitions, you know this, but you're not consciously thinking about it anymore. It's just in there, and that's kind of what this is. I want to ask you about one more thing, too, um, before, we, uh, before I let you go, and that is uh, a particular part of your broadcast uh, when you work with Slick. Uh, and one of my favorite moments, I think, when I've ever listened to the two of you guys was it was at the end of a, I think it was at the end of a quarter. I don't know if it was the end of a half, where there was a full court or a three-quarter court heave, and it went in, and you didn't say anything. You just said, I forget, whoever threw it up. It was like Lance Stevenson throws it up, three-quarter court heave, you hear the buzzer, and there's nothing except crowd noise. And then you just go, we're waiting. And Slick goes, oh, boom, baby. <laughs> Uh, how did that uh, call on three-pointers come to be? Well, it's kind of weird because my first year here, I worked with Clark Kellum. And then Clark went over to television. And then for the next several years, I worked alone, except in the playoffs. They would always give me a guy. So I had Jerry Seasting, I had Billy Keller, I had George McGinnis, and I had Slick. I knew Slick by then, but I didn't know anything about how he broadcast because he'd been on television, and he's doing the game at the same time I am. So we're in the old Boston Garden, and we're paired together for the first time. Well, Boom Baby was already part of his deal, but I didn't know that. So uh, we're playing, and Slick's sitting to my left, 
and the Pacers are attacking the basket to my right, so I can't see him. I'm watching the action. And Chuck Person puts up a three, and I start to describe it, and it goes through, and I'm starting to describe that, and all of a sudden, in my headset, there's this, oh, baby! I think, well, does this guy have Tourette's, or what's going on here? I was a little flummoxed. Well, the game's going on, so I can't ask him about it. A few possessions later, uh, same deal. I forgot who shot it. I just remember Chuck shot the first one. Somebody else shoots a three, and it's a boom, baby. So now I'm thinking, okay, that's his deal. That's his deal. So then I knew that. And then a couple years after that, we started working together all the time. And that's his thing. And I get it. And it's not a problem at all. Except every once in a while, he'll go into brain freeze and... Not necessarily brain freeze. Maybe he didn't know it was a three. Or maybe he does go into brain freeze. And I, I try to have fun with it then, like the situation you described. It's his deal. I'm not going to steal his thunder. Uh, every once in a great while, if he waits long enough and doesn't do anything, I might say, oh, it was a three, and then we move on. But uh, usually I try to have fun with it and say, uh, hey, are you with us? Uh, you, you don't like threes at what? Because, you know, part of Slick's appeal is that he's a personality. Everyone knows he's, he was a great coach, and he's an Indiana legend from high school to college to the Pacers, played in the NBA, has more knowledge and experience than the rest of us put together. So we accept that he's an expert. But he's not there because he's an expert. He's there because he's an icon, and he's a personality, and everybody loves him. So let's have some fun with him. Here, here's, my, here's my real philosophy about the whole thing. I told you before that I wanted to do games as I like to hear them. That's true. But my other philosophy about broadcasting is this. I take my job very, very seriously. I try not to take myself seriously at all. And so I can still have fun and make fun of myself or make fun of Slick and still be serious about what we're doing. I think the guy that starts taking himself too seriously runs into a problem, and I try to avoid that, and that's part of my philosophy with Slick. I lied. One more question. This is like the ultimate interview not to do because you never say final question because you always come up with another. Um, and I wanted to ask you about this, totally separate of this, um, just because of where I grew up. And I mentioned earlier you had been to a bunch of cities between Minneapolis and Indiana. Um, I grew up outside New York. I grew up listening to WFAN. Um, and I know that you were there at uh, really the beginning of it all. So uh, if you can, this is going to be like the broadest swath ever, uh, but what was it like to be at the birth of sports talk radio? And I, this is totally separate of everything we've talked about, but uh, to be in that point in history and see what was going on was like what? Well, now we have the advantage of history and retrospect, and it, it's cool because I can say I was on the staff of the very first all-sports station in the United States, and now there are hundreds or maybe thousands of them. It's become a format that's become very viable and very successful. And we started it, so I'm proud of that. It wasn't just me, obviously, but I was so young then. I, uh, I, I was 26, I think, when I got that job. And I was young, I was single, I was driven. You didn't think of perspective then. You just thought about, how can I turn this job into the next one? That was my perspective at the time. I, I knew that I was lucky. I was working with guys like Greg Gumbel and Jim Lampley and, and guys that were far more accomplished and experienced than I was. I tried to learn from them. But the underlying thing there, that we had contracts, but they were a year at a time, and we never... I, I left after a year, and at that time it wasn't clear if the format was going to succeed. Now, we were lucky that the, the owner, Jeff Smolian, who is the uh, owner of Emmis here in Indianapolis, stuck with it. I'm sure they lost money for a long time. And he could have pulled the plug, but he didn't. He stuck with it, and ultimately it became, several years, the top billing radio station in America. So it's a successful format, and it's been copied. But at the time, all we knew was we were starting something new. Many of us were young, and we looked at it, at least I did, as a stepping stone to something else. I wanted to do play-by-play, -play, and I'd done it before, but there was no play-by-play -play available there. I took that job because I thought New York would look good on my resume, but it did. It helped me. But the actual experience was great for obvious reasons. I learned a lot working with people like that. 
It was fun living in New York. And there's sort of a, a camaraderie that exists when you're on the Titanic. We thought we were on the Titanic. None of us thought it was going to work, or at least several of us didn't. But we were there for the experience. This would be a great experience. I'll be here until I can get out because I don't want to be here when it sinks. Yeah, right. And, 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 and also, we didn't know what we were doing because there was no prototype. And at the time, I, I, I will never forget this. They figured it out later. And I'm not saying they were stupid because I didn't know any differently. But we had, we had the rights for the New York Mets. That's all we had. And they wanted to get rid of the Mets because they thought play-by-play -play was a turnoff. Well, ultimately, they figured out that the more we can get, the better it helps us. But at that time, they didn't understand that. They thought the talk was the thing. And they didn't really succeed until after I left. And that's not cause and effect, by the way. <laughs> they didn't really succeed until they went away from the all-sports format and brought in Don Imus to do the mornings. Uh, now, the rest of it was still sports. But Imus was a, was a, you know, a cash cop. And so they started making some money on the morning show, and from there, they built it up. And they ended up getting the Knicks and the Rangers. I don't know what they have now, but I'm sure they have several properties. And that was one of the keys. You need as many franchises as you can on your air because people are driven to listen to the games. And hopefully, then they'll stick with you. Um, but I have so many great memories from there. I, I started on the overnight shift. And I worked with a guy named Steve Summers, who's still there. The Schmooze. The Schmooze. And Steve was, uh, he was a really talented guy. He'd come in from the West Coast. And he was the host, and I was the update guy. Uh, for those that don't know, the update guy comes in every 15 minutes and says the Mets won and the Yankees lost. Which, how crazy is that that you have to explain that nowadays, too? Because they don't really exist that much anymore. No. Oh, and, uh, and then you'd, especially on the overnight shift, which was way more laid back, then you'd schmooze with Steve for a while. And one of my great memories of that was this guy used to call in. He was obviously a staunch fan. He was Jerry from Queens. And he'd call in periodically, and he became a regular... Well, it was Jerry Seinfeld before he was Jerry Seinfeld. And then long after I left, he used to come into the studio and sit in with Steve once in a while when he was famous. The overnight callers are so different. I've done the talk show during the drives, and the overnight callers are just so different. Actually better, I think. More interesting. Uh, but we were, we were trying to figure out where to go, and that, that was the other thing. These updates, which barely exist anymore, they were adamant about four an hour, 15, 30, 45 in the top. And, and that was, well, it was before the Internet, and, and before info was as readily available as it is now, so there was a certain logic to it. But, but it was an interruption in the show, you know, you'd be trying to... You, by, the, by the time you got back on and started taking calls, it was time to go to another update. So it was, it, was sort of, it was sort of a detriment in terms of establishing a flow to the program, and they eventually figured that out, but that's how I got in. The guy who hired me in Minneapolis took over in New York, and he brought me with him, and that's how I ended up in New York, and it was a great experience. Was Jerry from Queens a good caller, or was he like, yes. oh, this guy's calling in again? No, Jerry from Queens was a knowledgeable caller, and he obviously had a sense of humor. No, he was, a, he was one of our regular overnight calls. What's up with these first basemen? They can't hit the ball. He didn't call every day. I, I can't remember how frequently he called, but he did call. And we didn't, at least I didn't know who he was. This was 80, let's see, I was there the summer of 87. I was there from like July of 87 to July of 88. So I don't, Seinfeld started in the early 90s, right? I'm sure he was known on the local stand-up circuit by then, but we didn't know who he was, or at least I didn't. Pretty soon he's Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, I was hopeful that, you know, Costanza would start calling in, or maybe Kramer, but they never did. <laughs> Well, that's because Costanza was busy working for the Yankees. He couldn't call in. and, yes. and yeah, that would, Not on a Mets yeah, station. Yeah, no. No, conflict of, yeah. Um, Mark, if people wanted to, uh, if young broadcasters wanted to contact you, how do they find you on social media or catch the Pacers or, or whatnot? I'm on uh, Twitter, at Mark underscore J underscore Boyle. You can always reach me there. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. You can find me. And I always promise young guys this. If you, if you reach out, I will get back to you. If you ask me to listen to your tapes, I will. might not be timely. I might not get to it for months, but I'll do it. Um, I, I'm a big believer in... You know, I'll give you a specific story. I, I like to think I would help young guys anyway, because I, I value... I consider this, and this is a little extreme, and it's, it's not medicine or the law, but I consider this to be a noble profession. And I consider part of my responsibility to make sure the next generation understands that and carries on. And that's why I help young guys. So I like to think I would do it anyway. Oh, and 
let's not be politically incorrect, young gals also. Um, but this happened to me when I was a rookie in the NBA. Marv Albert, who everybody knows, and Bob Ryan, who I think most know, a columnist from the Boston Globe, he's been on ESPN, he's a revered figure. Those two guys who were already well established, they both came up to me when I was a rookie. They came up to me, not me to them, and said, hey, let us know if we can do anything to help you. I thought, if guys like that can do that, then why can't I? Uh, and so I'm always, always open to helping young people. I, I think it's important. I, I want our profession to continue to be respected. And the best way to do that is to make sure that young people coming into our world have whatever advice and counsel I can give them. Well, Mark, this has been a, a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully some people sitting around us here in Starbucks have gotten a kick out of it as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, I appreciate you coming in here and, uh, and sitting down with me today. Anytime. It was my pleasure. I can only imagine, like, I can only imagine what Jerry from Queens might want to talk about. Uh, yeah, I mean, Queens, yeah, he's probably a Mets fan. But, like, Jerry from Queens maybe has some thoughts on the Yankees' front office. I don't know. I don't know. You know what they eat. What they eat at the Yankees' front office. How's on, huh? Yeah, let's hit. Pass that on down. Let's get a little look at that. Big Stein wants a little taste. Come on. Come on. Pass it down here. That's a good boy. Okay, let's do, hey, what's in this thing? Uh, cheese, pepperoni, uh, eggplant. Uh, eggplant, huh? Mm, that's a hell of a thing. All right, all right, back to business. Here you go. Very good, very good. Excellent, excellent little calzone you got there, Costanza. Never gets old. <laughs> that's incredible, by the way. Jerry from Queens. Bonkers. Many thanks to Mark Boyle for uh, joining us here on this episode. Awesome to sit down and pick his brain, and uh, hopefully you guys... Got out of that uh, what I did as well. Many thanks to Mark for, uh, for sitting down and kind of diving into all of that. I mean, I'll reiterate what I said at the very beginning. And we talked about his, his pacing and the control, the grasp he has on a broadcast. When you turn on 1070 The Fan and you're driving through Indianapolis or Indiana, anywhere on the network, like he is just in command of what he's doing. You know what's happening. You know where the ball is. He's so level-headed and level and, and even-handed in the way that he just tells you what's happening. Um, and he gets excited. You know, ding dong, the witch is dead. You know, I mean, he gets excited. <laughs> you look it up on YouTube. Um, but but he's just he's an easy listen. Like the I think the greatest compliment you can get in this industry is that you're an easy listen. And Mark Boyle is an easy listen. So uh, good to pick his brain here uh, this week on the pod. Anyway, uh, it's Friday, Sunday. I've got a plan to North Carolina. Hopefully you guys do too. Would love to see you at the National Sports Media Association seminar for a little podcast chat on Monday. Uh, until then, or if not, until next Friday, this is Play by Playcast. My name is Joel Gaudet, and we are out. See you.